was a kind of important part of the fabric of growing up in Newcastle and I think there was a sense even when way back then that one automatically had a sense of how integral it was to the whole of Tyneside um, uh, and that was sort of confirmed when I came back after university and I worked as a journalist and it, it was that same thing although there was a sense uh, even then in the 70s that that the Tyne was somehow dying as, a, as an industrial powerhouse, which it had once been. And of course, the landscape of the Tyne had changed completely. And, and um, I do have a very vivid memory of taking a boat trip not long after it and being kind of shocked by the, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but like a sort of marine Detroit. These vast open spaces absolutely testify to an absence of something because they're really striking in the landscape, you're moving through the landscape and suddenly there's a vast area of, of flatness. Maybe there's some sort of flooring that's left, some sort of concrete floor that might have been where the shop floor was. It absolutely conjures up that there was something there before, an abs a, 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 I would call it a site that has been cleared away in an unseemly fashion. There's buildings along the quayside I worked in and we put new central heating systems in them and those buildings are gone and as I walk along you can still see because they've been knocked down you've just got the bare the base of them and you can still I can still pick things out that I did 30 odd 40 years ago and you say well I remember sort of doing that but the, the building's gone there's just the remnants but you'll see little little objects that you think remind you of what what you did our building's all gone now it's all new um, just dwellings just domestic houses at the top of Tyne Street so all, all that area disappeared and you're thinking it's it's just all it's it's just alien people have a very direct connection to their family history and their family stories I think it's it's more pronounced here than virtually anywhere else so having a, a sense of the importance of particular um, f geographical features um, is very pronounced here and I think of all the geographical features at least as far as Tyneside is concerned is the river. The issue here is the speed of change, the speed at which that's disappeared and so that's kind of quite traumatic I think for people to even people who didn't work at these shipyards and factories as they pass through the landscape they no longer see these markers of local identity and these aren't just markers of local identity, but they're places through which people seethe, power seethe, energy seethe. And they're, they're also connected to the rest of the landscape, so they also have a huge impact on that, on people pouring out of the factory at the end of the shift, for instance, inhabiting the pubs and the shops, catching the buses and the trains.
I was devastated, I was totally uh, disorientated because everything I'd set my sights on had gone. Uh, and the same was for most of the people I knew. I mean, the whole, my whole perspective had to change because my basic where I was from had gone. It just had totally gone. They had no identity left. Uh, they couldn't say what was going to be the future for them. There'd been an industrial community for centuries, and here we were faced with total manufacturing and industrial collapse. I think the other thing was there was a political importance. Here we were faced with a central government that had destroyed manufacturing industry, but in no way did they have any sort of plan to regenerate regions like um, Derwentside. Uh, so what the politicians did is they turned to perhaps the simplest of arguments was that we had to find the identity um, for the future and the, the identity which was our past. I give you a toast, ladies and gentlemen. I give you a toast, ladies and gentlemen. It's like a painting, an artist with a painting, starting a painting. You, you, you look at a shipyard, you see a couple of slipways, and you see a couple of cranes coming over and put a, a couple of plates, steel plates on this on these slipways, and you see the lads measuring out and things like that. And as you're going past on a tugboat, all the time, every other day, whatever, you look at it and you see extra bits being put on. And they're creating something of beauty. Well, it was like a beautiful young woman, you know, being created. If the yard is, being, is going to be privatised or closed or whatever, what it would mean to the town, it's, it's, it's not only catastrophic in the sense of the immediate impact. I mean, for example, we at Austin Pickersgills now deal with 251 subcontractors. Now, from those 251, there's 235 actually based in the northeast. So the effect is, is tremendous, it's a disaster, and this town would end up as a, as a, as a wilderness, industrial wilderness, without any doubt. thousand by thousand over a period of three to four years and basically now we're down to the position where we have a very young labour force and a lot of these lads while they have worked on the private industry before it was under the era of food and plenty we had big tankers on the berth our berths were full and it's easy to accept privatisation under them standards but you must go back over. Go back to the 1950s, not too far away, you know. 1950s, when my births were laid idle. And privatisation then meant a totally different thing to what a lot of the young people accept as privatisation at the present time. It meant standing in a market when a foreman come up and said, well, OK, half past seven in the morning, I want two men, you know. And two men he picked and the rest were sent home. It meant being finished on a 24 hour notice basis. That when a ship hit the water, you know, and the, the, all the razzmatazz what goes with the launching of a ship, you know, three cheers, hip hip, parade, you know. Television cameras would catch all of this like, but what they would never catch is at the end of the day, when the ship hit the water and the little white slips came round with your services are no longer required. One of the things that uh, certainly properly speculation 
uh, is engaged in, and also local authorities too, is that they want to sell space that used to be used for something else. Now, if you keep an industrial ruin there, the previous use of that site is all too evident. It's all too clear. And so what I think is important here is that, that property speculators want to appeal to developers who can imagine what they might put on that site. And if they see a, an old shipyard there, that's difficult to imagine. Secondly, I think local authorities, following the demise of heavy industry, in this case shipbuilding, want to erase it from the present so that they can look forward to the future. And so when I was travelling around Townside, there was quite a lot of that, of totally erased spaces. A ship is a metal box exporting other people's goods. And that's the best way of looking at it. So that the downstream effects of a collapse of shipbuilding are very, very severe indeed. No one benefits from the deterioration, the, the, the decline of the industry. Everyone, not just the workers in the industries, will benefit from a viable industry which is developing as one of the important lead industries in terms of our balance of trade and balance of payments. Why otherwise do the Japanese maintain their industry and why are the Koreans building up their industry? Because it is so important in general economic terms. We've never condemned the Japanese or the Korean working class for their attempt to organize ourselves or develop. In fact, we applaud them. Um, <coughs> I think from the day one, we've realized that the problem never lay with the, the, the conditions or the existence of Korean workers and so on. They've got the right to build ships like anybody else has. Uh, and the best look to them. The best look to them in their, their organizational efforts. But uh, what we did realize is that it belongs, the problem belongs to British capitalism. Do you see kind of nature as slightly reclaiming these industrial sites? Well, uh, when we did our walk, I kind of had a, an expectation that, you know, whenever um, uh, mankind's uh, industrial or other kinds of developments sort of cease or, or, or wither, it isn't long before nature comes in and reclaims it. Um, but even I was surprised by the extent to which um, that's happened on, on the Tyne and I was astonished by just for instance the, the huge variety of bird life that there is um, on and around the river so one of the discoveries that I made is that um, the Tyne running all the way from the sea up to Hexham and beyond uh, um, is a kind of corridor for migrating birds um, and they obviously come down to, to feeds. You get warblers and flycatchers, pibbits and thrushes and all sorts of things. Well, the kiddiewakes, the, the small gull species that nests on different buildings along the river, uh, first came to the river in the late 1940s. And then since then, over the following 60 years or so, it's spread along the river, nesting on different buildings, often derelict, but often also working buildings as well, on window ledges and other ledges on these structures and they've taken to the river during the industrial phase and subsequently as well and their numbers are still increasing at the moment if they're left to their own devices and there's suitable nesting locations for them that they can spot so they've come into the river and moved in in over the last 50 60 years or so that's an example of uh, nature moving yeah. I suppose and adapting a, f a final thing I also want to say about ruination, though, is that it's also caused through two other processes. It's caused through the material out of which a building is made. So certain kinds of buildings are not made with substantial building materials and are very susceptible to ruination. So as soon as the, the windows open and the rain and the wind get in, they very quickly get colonised by plant and animal life. And those materials can very quickly decay but that also of course depends upon what agencies are around so is there a lot of rain uh, you know is the is the air toxic these sorts of things are kind of quite important in addition to which we might kind of acknowledge the role of human agents people who break in and smash windows and let the rain and the water in but in somewhere like the northeast ruination proceeds very quickly because 
very often people break into properties, they're not really <laughs> protected. Uh, and also, because it's wet and it's windy and it's, and it's rainy and uh, things fall apart quite quickly. When you get derelict land, you get all sorts of flowers, fauna and fauna coming back, you know, that it just encroaches back on. I think once things have gone, if nature's left to itself, it'll just, it'll just get back to where it was, really. It'll just cover it up again. It's, you know, to my mind, I like to see it, you know. I'd rather have grassy banks or trees, shrubs, bushes, than I would to see more factories going up, because it's a nice, it's just a nice landscape. It's, uh, it's just a nice river, really. It's, you know, all has been 